Okay, good morning, everybody. That was kind of interesting. Uh, you're probably sitting there like me, a little bit puzzled, a little bit scared, maybe a little bit puzzled. So let's try and get things back to some kind of reality and talk about some pragmatic situations and, and perhaps solutions as well. I'm a naturally fairly optimistic person, so I wanted this, t this title to reflect that a little bit. We've heard a lot this morning, especially in that last video, about quite negative things to do with cybersecurity. But I'd like to try and point out a few things. Perhaps if we do cybersecurity well, we might be able to enable uh, better outcomes for our businesses and our organizations. So I'll try and flag those up as we go through this. So that's my agenda for today. I'm going to start by identifying three key trends. I see this is the theme of the conference is future of cybersecurity. So three key trends, I think, in IT that are going to continue to grow and be important in our lives. I think that there's a common risk factor across those scenarios that we need to think about. And that's the first time I'm going to mention the P word, privilege. And I don't mean the Jacob Rees-Mogg type privilege. You'll see the kind of privilege I mean as we go through this. There's a solution. You wouldn't be surprised to hear that it's something to do with what we do at, at Osirium. I'll mention that. And I think there are three key parts to a solution that I'll flag up to you as well. And I'll also hi highlight those ways that I think that we can help businesses be more uh, productive and more agile as they move forward. So let's dive in. We haven't got very long. And I realize I'm between you and me and coffee. So this is a very important slot now. So trend number one. Let's think about attacks on our businesses and our organizations and where those attacks are coming from. Now, these three major groups probably aren't going to be much of a surprise to you. Obviously, external threats, whether that's gangs or foreign governments or just uh, malicious attackers that are trying to get inside your business to, to you know, plant malware or to steal secrets. Internal threats, we always talk about in this, in this scenario, uh, kind of disgruntled employees the victims of phishing attacks, but actually there's another group that perhaps you're not thinking about. I'll come back and highlight it, that in a second. And also, really importantly, I think, is the third-party threat. I think we heard in the dark trace talked about um, contractors having access to your sites, uh, to your business systems. How long do they have access for? It doesn't get shut off. And there's another hidden group there that I'd like to highlight as well. So in the internal threat group, the people I'd like to flag up to you, maybe you're not thinking about too much besides the disgruntled employee or the, the victim of, a, of an attack, is the over-enthusiastic amateur, or sometimes called the good Samaritan. The employee that somehow gets hold of a privileged account, some login credentials that gives them something like administrator privileges, they think they know what they're doing and they're really happy to help out. Oh, I'll save IT some time, I'll just do it myself. It's really easy for those people to suddenly take your internet presence off by changing a firewall rule you didn't know about, changing a DNS record, because they don't know. They might know how to use one function, but they don't know how to use the whole tools that they're getting into. So, so the uh, over-enthusiastic amateur is a group you ought to be watching out for. And the hidden threat inside the third party, well, we worry about, or we need to have partners and collaborators, outsourcers come in and work with us very closely. Modern businesses just couldn't work any other way. And we put in controls about you know, have, giving them key cards to get into the building, giving them restricted access to our networks, perhaps. But the hidden threat there that I'd ask you to think about is what do they do when they need more help or when they subcontract out your work? I've run many development teams in the past, and I know when I've been outsourcing to India to do some development work, we've had some really great engineers, but they would change pretty frequently. Every couple of weeks, I might have new people on the team. And I kind of suspected the people I was talking to weren't actually doing the work that I, they were, said they were doing. They were actually giving it to another person to do. So I would call this a subcontractor threat. So think about that scenario. What's happening to those credentials when you give them to a partner? Are the par is the partner keeping control over those credentials? The second trend, and I think this is going to grow really fast as well, is empowering the business, employees in the business, to do more for themselves. Lots of good reasons for that. IT is overworked, and end users want to have more control of what they do in their lives as part of their, their happiness at work, if you like. Empowered end users. So think about the scenario where you have a new employee coming into the business. When the new starter comes on, they have to create accounts in multiple systems so they can get their work done. Maybe you raise a ticket in a help desk system, maybe it's ServiceNow or whatever. You have to create an Active Directory record, create an email account, create an Office 365 account, 
update the HR system. This is actually our workflow. We have a Breeze is our HR system. Create a certificate for a VPN. Uh, maybe create an account in the expense, uh, expense recognition, uh, rec a reporting system. If you're a developer, you might want to have development tools set up or continuous integration and delivery pipeline accounts set up. Every one of those systems has their own administrator, and each one of those systems has their own administrator account and credentials. To complete this workflow, I need to have at least six, probably, administrators all available to do the work. So it's no surprise that we hear frequently new employees start. They may not have all the accounts they need for the first week or for the first month or the first three months waiting for an administrator to be available. And you need to do that because the administrator is the person that knows how to run those tools, and they're the ones with access to the secrets that allow them to get their work done. And nobody can share that, or they shouldn't be sharing them because of silos of responsibility. So that's a real risk. Now, you'd want to solve that problem by automating, and there are multi -way, multiple ways of doing that. IT administrators are really clever and very creative when creating scripts. But the trend that we're starting to see is people trying to use tools like robotic process automation, RPA, which is doing great work inside the business, maybe processing insurance claims or working out which invoices need to be paid. But there's a clue in the name here. This, they're all robots. They're used to performing the same operation at great volume. And there's a number of risks involved with RPA. Notably, how do these tools cr connect to those back-end systems? Do they have to have secrets embedded within them? And what happens when those systems change or some decision has to be made? Human beings still have to get involved. So they don't really have the flexibility for those high-value, high-risk operations like creating new accounts, setting up a new domain server, those kind of complicated tasks. Robotic process automation is not appropriate. The third trend is one that's probably not surprising at all. Complexity will continue to increase. In the blurb for this talk, I talked about machine learning and AI and lots of other technology coming in. But actually, it's much more simple than that. Think about an administrator and how many servers or devices or applications or web services they have to work with every day to complete their work. Just one admin may have access to hundreds of devices and has to know how to connect to all of them securely. Interestingly, those devices are, are increasingly turning up outside of IT. You're going to have marketing teams setting up marketing automation systems, sales teams with their CRM systems, finance teams with their um, Xero and other, uh, Sage and other accounting packages. So those admins, those devices may not be inside IT anymore. So do you even know where those devices are? Do you know who's got access to which devices? Have the right people got access to all the servers they need to complete their work? Have too many people got too much access? With that kind of complexity, it's impossible to manage or have any confidence that you're secure. So those are three trends that I think are growing really fast. I think there's a common uh, aspect to all of them, that is the need for managing privileged accounts. If you think this is a fairly typical kind of uh, attack kill chain, you know, a, an attack tries to get inside the business through malware, spear phishing or whatever, They'll probably sit around for a while trying to find out what are the interesting accounts, where are the interesting devices, where's the interesting data in the surveillance phase. And we know that can last weeks, months, even years while they're lurking trying to collect information. At some point, the attack will turn much more active and become uh, you know, active, actively moving across the network, lateral movement, having attacked one server. Can I get to another and can I get to another? What other data can I get to? find the interesting data, start exfiltrating it, and then set, set themselves up for the return visit maybe in a year's time. And there's a tipping point in the middle there when the attack moves from surveillance to lateral movement, and that's where a privileged account or one or more accounts has been compromised. This is where I've got the login to the database. I've got the administrator password for the DNS servers. I've got the administrator password for the firewalls so I can start injecting more attacks later. So clearly, in the kill chain, privileged accounts are really valuable. So it's no wonder that foresters say that 80% of all attacks involve privileged accounts. In fact, I'd go further and say 95% of all IT work, IT admin work, the help desk work, involves privileged accounts. Whether it's, can you unlock my password? Can you set up a new PC? Can you um, add me as an, as an administrator to our database? Virtually all the work that IT help desk do involves some kind of administrator account. Occasionally, you have to go along and turn the machine off and back on again. Maybe they don't need it there. But most of their work involves some kind of administrator access. So no wonder they're really important. So 
what's the solution? Well, I think there are three key elements to this. The first is, and we heard about this a little bit earlier on from one of the other speakers, about least privilege. The second is separating out who the people are from what they can do. And the third thing is extending that then to automation to enable the business. So let's take a look at what I mean by that. Adopting least privilege. It's really useful for me, I think, to think about tiers of privilege. And it's a great starting point in your planning and your security policies. Think about who the people are and what level of access do they need to the systems. As a normal user, if I'm somebody that's running a, working on a help desk and I'm just taking calls all day and logging calls, I don't need very much. I just need to log into my PC, maybe access my email, and, uh, and, and keep you know, typing as fast as I can when I'm listening to calls. But other administrators may need to run specific functions within an application. So that could be I can log on to the Active Directory Management Console and I can reset a password, but I can't create new users, or more importantly, I can't delete or change existing ones. I can't change an interest rate on a savings account. I don't need access to that function. Others might need access to a whole application. I need access to SQL Server, but I don't need access to the whole server that that SQL Server is running on. And ultimately, the people with the godlike powers that have the root server access can do anything on those devices, on those systems. And this, this kind of circular diagram gives an idea of the potential blast radius. That normal user, if compromised, has a fairly limited impact if they get compromised. The root server access, if they get compromised, then real bad things can happen to your business. So it's all about the right privilege to the right people for the, at the right time, for the right period of time. How long do they need that access for? Second one, separate people from what they can do. Imagine our complicated scenario again. Look at that, that administrator who's got access to many servers. The trick is to introduce what we call privileged access management. In this world, the person identifies who they are, and that can be through some biometrics, a multi-factor authentication, whatever it is. So I can be confident you are who you say you are. And then I have a set of rules and policies that says these are the things that you can do. So you might have root level access on one server, but you can only run one function on another server. And as soon as you've got that central point of control, you've got visibility. You know who's got access to which systems. So if you need to change a password on a server, you know who's going to be impacted. In fact, you don't have to tell those people what password is because they never have access to those credentials. You also can take away um, access when they don't need it anymore. And you can start doing some really interesting things. You keep, the network, you keep those credentials off the network. You're never going to see passwords and usernames passing across the wire. But you can start doing things like behavioral analytics. Are people doing things they don't normally do? Can you do a full session recording what they're doing so you've got evidence for forensic investigation later or just for training purposes? The third part of the solution is do the same thing, but think about automation. Here, we talk about privileged process automation, and, and Ethereum have a new product called Opus that does exactly that. So again, tell us who you are, prove who you are. Now we can tell you what tasks you're allowed to perform. Maybe it's create a new user, and you have to go off and update six servers, and you can do that entirely without knowing what the logins or the administrator accounts are on any of those systems. So that gives you a lot of, of benefits. You've got security, you've got humans involved if flexibility is needed or decisions need to be made, but you've got that automation that empowers end users. We're starting to see people actually pass IT operations out to line of business organizations so they can do it for themselves. So I said I'd wrap up by giving you some positive views of the world. I think if you do all this right, there's all sorts of benefits that you can see. And I'm not going to go through them all now, but primarily it's about increasing security, but also removing manual access. And we know that most IT work is actually rework, fixing something that went wrong doing a manual process before. So there's lots and lots of benefits if you can get this right. So thank you very much for your time this morning. Please do come down to the Assyrium stand. We're just on the right-hand side as you come into Exhibit Hall. We'd love to talk some more about this. Tell us what you're thinking about in trying to manage your privileged accounts inside your business. And I look forward to speaking to you later. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank <laughs> you.